PhD in natural resource management at the University of Rwanda. And um, we're really pleased to have Dr. Lisa Dale speaking with us. I was just chatting with her before we got started today that um, we first met her when she applied for a um, Fulbright uh, research. It was called a Fulbright Specialist. Was that the name of the title? Yeah, that you that's had? the program. And um, that was a pretty uh, amazing program. Um, she did get funded and came here. And I think that's really what led to a lot of collaborations with us and led to the research she's gonna to present today. Um, Lisa is a, um, a, a academic staff at Columbia University and she is a, affiliated with Columbia's Center for Resilient Cities and Landscapes. And she's also um, affiliated with us. She's an honorary lecturer at the University of Rwanda and a senior research fellow at um, our center. And so um, we're very, very pleased to have her today to um, talk to us about this research that she was able to come and do here in Rwanda between um, the windows of the lockdowns that were happening. And um, I just want to mention also that uh, Lisa's work here is really a wonderful example of the kind of collaborations that we see because she came here um, with the, the intent to do research, but really collaborated with our junior staff and with uh, staff at the center and mentored um, young researchers in research methods and um, in a very collaborative process. So um, she really serves as a great model for how this kind of collaboration can be done on a topic that is very timely um, for today, climate change adaptation and the resettlement policy in Rwanda. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Lisa, and we look forward to hearing from you about your work. Thank you. Thanks so much, Beth, and I'm really so excited to be here. Um, Beth is right, I got very lucky with my timing this year and was able to come to Rwanda and uh, conduct field research, and I just kind of got lucky and narrowly missed um, some of the stricter lockdowns that were happening. Um, so this is really the first chance I've had to present this research. I actually conducted two separate projects while I was there. This is the first one, um, and I hope when the second one is ready to share, maybe I'll I'll come back and present that one as well. Um, as Beth noted, I'm affiliated both with Columbia University in the US. I teach in the sustainable development program there and with uh, University of Rwanda. Um, so let me get started. Let's see if I can. So in a quick overview of where this presentation goes, we're gonna talk really quickly about climate change um, and what climate change adaptation means and why we would care about it. Then I'll talk about the research context where this project took place. What do we know about sustainable development in Rwanda? rural poverty in particular, and where resettlement fits into that. Then we'll go deeply into the Rueru Model Green Village, which was the case I studied in this research. Um, and we'll go through all of the components of that research. And then we'll finish up by thinking about some of the next steps. Um, so before I get too far, I want to uh, make sure that I acknowledge the incredible support I had on that end. I'm back in the US now, but I could not have done this research without um, the help of a number of you. Some of, uh, some of you are here on this call, I can see. My research partner in this project is John Mugabo. He's a local sustainable development expert, consultant, uh, worked for a long time with the Millennium Villages um, and helped get me connected at Weru. I then hired a team at the University of Rwanda. Um, and there we are. There's my whole team. I think all of the team members are here on this call right now. Um, you can see Isaac Hitimana is next to me in that photo. Um, and he served as the field coordinator, helping to organize all of our field trips, a lot of those, those logistics. Um, and then the rest of the team, Sandrine, Jeanette, and um, Noel were our field uh, enumerators and interviewers. So hats off to this team. And a, and a special big thanks to COE and the University of Rwanda that gave me sort of a platform uh, to and some office space and a lot of support and guidance as I set forth to try to do this research um, just this past April and May. So to situate this research, um, 
my field of study at Columbia is primarily in climate change policy. When we talk about climate change policy, oftentimes people immediately think about climate change mitigation policy, which refers to all of the policies that are happening around the world to reduce harmful greenhouse gas emissions. But the other side of that coin and the other component of climate change policy is the adaptation side. And these are policies that help individuals, households, communities, and countries deal with a climate that is already changing. So it's not focused on reducing emissions. It's focused on adjusting lifestyles, infrastructure, and institutions to better fit the variability that we're now seeing in the climate. One way to think about what adaptation means is risk management. So what do we mean by risk? In this context, when it comes to climate change, when we talk about risk, we generally understand risk to be a function of a hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. And the way those three elements interact create risk. So a hazard, for example, might be a flood or a storm or a drought. Exposure is how uh, likely it is that your farm, for example, would be uh, targeted by that drought or that flood. And then vulnerability is the uh, foundational starting point of susceptibility that a household or community has to experiencing harm from that exposure to that hazard. When you combine those things, uh, you get risk. Um, and so that's the, the understanding um, that I begin with. This research is largely focused in the vulnerability piece. And the argument is, if we can deploy social protection resources and um, other policy supports that reduce vulnerability of communities, even if we're unable to remove the hazard or significantly change the exposure, we will lower risk simply by targeting vulnerability. So that's just a starting point to get us thinking about this project. So of course the context for this research is in Rwanda. And since I'm speaking here in a Rwandan um, setting, I think some of this is well known. This is just a photo I took of kids near Volcanoes Park a few years ago on an earlier trip to Rwanda. As we all know, um, much of Rwanda's current development and settlement policies date to the genocide in 1994 and the aftermath of that. Following that catastrophic event, economic recovery in Rwanda has been exceptionally strong. Uh, average 7.5% growth for the decade uh, most recently. And this is all sort of pre-COVID. So we know some of those numbers have changed, but certainly Rwanda has been an economic development success story in the continent and indeed in the world. Many of, econo many of Rwanda's development policies identify a, a goal of shifting the country away from an economy where uh, it is rooted in subsistence agriculture, instead to an economy that is rooted in knowledge and service. Um, and this is the where many of the economic growth and sustainable development policies that come out of the government are focused. They are trying to achieve this fundamental shift. But still, and despite this robust growth, and I think some very strong policy efforts to support it, Rwanda still suffers. And Rwanda ranks um, 157th out of 195, I think, countries on the Human Development Index, meaning life expectancy is still quite low. Literacy, income, healthcare access, it's, and some other indicators are all quite low. Um, so Rwanda, even though it is experiencing tremendous growth, still um, largely is a subsistence economy. About 80% of the population are rural smallholder farmers with large families. This is a really challenging setting to uh, increase economic growth. And the poverty, the persistent and durable poverty that um, Rwanda is trying to tackle is overwhelmingly located in rural areas. Um, I think this is no surprise. 93% of the poorest Rwandans are living in rural areas. So poverty in Rwanda is largely a rural problem. So that's where this research is focused. So I'm interested really in settlement and resettlement policies in Rwanda. 
And we can start by looking at the human settlement policy that was enacted right after the genocide when people began to come back to Rwanda from um, refugee camps and, and from other countries where they had fled. Um, as people began streaming back into the country, the government began to try to organize policies so that when people came back in, they would be housed in villages. This was seen as um, the it was going to be the sort of foundational institution for rural life is the village. And so the government envisioned these grouped houses called imidugudu uh, that are the villages. Um, and the idea that the government has is that this allows them to more efficiently provide villages with infrastructure, with services, um, and with um, opportunities when people are living close together instead of sort of scattered about the countryside without an organizing center. They also uh, believe that these villages will create and promote social cohesion, build democracy, and at the same time, free up unused land as people are living more densely together, and that freed up land can promote ecosystem health and protection. So this is the, the idea of rural life in Rwanda should be organized around villages. Um, a few years later, uh, more policies came into play that also sort of uh, seek to improve outcomes in rural areas, the crop intensification program and land use consolidation. These are big laws sort of outside the reach of the presentation today. Um, but one thing that came out of those policies was the creation of farmers cooperatives. And that factors into uh, some of this research. Um, farmers cooperatives uh, help rural farmers in particular join together, access markets, get credit, and learn from one another in these imidugudus. Um, at the same time, um, additional policies that are relevant for this talk are the Ubudehe and the Girinka programs. Um, the Ubudehe program has won awards internationally for the way it categorizes wealth levels um, and then offers social supports based on those categories. Um, the poorest households in Rwanda through the Girinka program are given a cow as a foundational support for nutrition and for dignity. Um, so this is sort of the setting for this research that I undertook. These pieces, the economic development, the uh, rural settlement policy and the villagization policies are all wrapped up together in what is now known as the Integrated Development Program, the IDP connects economic policies, poverty reduction policies and rural resettlement policies into something of a coherent approach to rural development called integrated development. Central to the IDP are these model villages. Um, the early model villages, and here's a great photo of President Kagame helping to build one of the early houses in one of the earliest model villages, um, were built and then district leaders were encouraged to replicate them and build them in their own districts. Some of those model villages were considered green. They have additional environmental protection goals and attributes um, that help with uh, the, uh, sorry that I'm looking at the chat, uh, model villages that um, the green villages help to amplify the uh, environmental protection element of the Imidugudu. So today, fast forward to today in 2021, 67.5% of rural residents live in Imidugudu. That's very close to the goal the government set of 70% by 2020. And I know the longer term goal is for 100% that all of the rural areas should be organized in these planned villages. So the IDP, the Integrated Development Program, has 11 pillars. And we're gonna come back to these at the very end of my research talk, but these are the 11 principles that undergird the approach to development. So development through the model villages should include in enhanced social protection, better infrastructure, development of cooperatives, farmers cooperatives, and some other cooperatives as well, opportunities for off-farm employment, promotion of microfinance, access to credit and insurance, Resettlement, but it's interesting to note that the way the pillar is worded is voluntary resettlement, leadership development, some attention to post-harvest, processing and marketing, 
productivity of land, promotion of um, uh, information technology, and rehabilitating ecosystems. These are the pillars of the IDP, and they pull from all of these other economic and development policies. Okay, so let's turn to the case study that I researched, the case of Rueru. Um, here's a map of where we were. Um, you can see oop, the where's my, the circle didn't show up. Down on the very bottom, you can see Lake Rueru. And I thought I had a, a circle on this slide. Maybe you can see where my arrow is. Um, I'm down here, that? right near the Burundi border. This is Lake Rueru. And uh, the islands, Sharita and Mazane Island are here on this, in this lake. And right to the edge of that lake is where the new model village was built. People who were living on Sharita and Mazane Islands beginning in 2016 faced a mandatory resettlement policy. Um, they were obligated to move off the islands. The islands were intended to be repurposed and were considered high risk and unsafe. That resettlement happened across four distinct phases. Uh, there's my red circle. So now you can see where we are. That's the um, Lake Ruru area. area. When we were there in June, just a couple of months ago, 1,777 individuals comprising 296 households now lived in Rueru Model Green Village. They had been resettled from the islands. Um, those who had been removed from Mazane Island are not permitted to go back. It has now been converted to a military use because it's right on the border with Burundi. There are still some remaining households on the Sharita Island. Um, those are uh, slated for resettlement in the future. And people who have been moved off of that island still have some limited access to their croplands. Um, but Mazane Island, again, no access. But that gives you a sense of where we were and, and where this case uh, was. So what are the key research questions and objectives we had for this project? Um, I wanted to understand very broadly how uh, climate change adaptation is looking in rural communities like Rueru. What are they facing? What are the opportunities? And what are the biggest challenges they face? Um, we're also particularly focused on resettlement programs. How are these programs functioning as a climate adaptation strategy? Are people better off living in Rueru Model Green Village than they were on Mazane Island? Um, that's the type of question we were curious about. Um, given the timing of this research, we were also interested in understanding how the pandemic uh, was affecting these rural livelihoods. Because the pandemic is, um, in some ways, a model shock that mimics a climate change shock. Uh, it disrupts a community, it disrupts supply chains and markets. And so seeing how these communities are weathering the pandemic might give us some additional insights into climate change adaptation. Um, but additionally, this research was really the process of the research itself was part of the project. So um, building capacity, training up these UR students to be my team, um, and giving them opportunities to work on a research project like this uh, was also part of my goal. And I, I wasn't sure how far we'd get with the research, but I thought, well, at least I'll have the opportunity to work with some University of Rwanda students um, and help in that way. This research was quite small. I called it a pilot the whole time I was there. Um, and it's really intended to be a building block toward a, a larger project in the future. So I'm sharing this pilot research with you today with the hope of building this in the future. So what did we do? We traveled to Rueru Model Green Village and we sampled households there. We made sure to interview and contact households in all four phases of resettlement. They had arrived at different times and the houses they were living in were constructed a bit differently in each phase. So we used convenience and quota sampling. Convenience sampling just means we walked through the village and interviewed people who were available. Quota sampling means we made sure to interview people across all four phases of resettlement so that each one had a quota. Um, we ended up conducting 38 semi-structured interviews with households. Those interviews were about 30 minutes long. And we additionally conducted 26 much shorter interviews that we call blinding interviews. And these were held uh, to maximize anonymity and safety for our respondents. There was some concern that if 
uh, people were being asked about how well this government program was working, that they might uh, not feel safe to share with us if they were having real problems. Uh, so part of helping to create anonymity so nobody would know who was watching, who had said what to us, we conducted 26 additional interviews in the team we called these are fake interviews. We went to the door, we asked somebody, who lives here? How long have you been here? How many people are in your household? Um, and a couple of other demographic questions. And then we said, thank you very much for your time. And we went to the next house. We didn't record a whole long interview, but we wanted to mix it up and contact more households to make it safer. Um, these interviews, the longer interviews, the semi-structured interviews were recorded. And then my very able team translated and transcribed them. Those transcripts, uh, we then analyzed. Uh, Grace Jin is on this call. She's my graduate assistant here at Columbia University. She helped me using in vivo software to analyze those transcripts. Um, we also, when we were in the field, relied on observation and photographs to help us make sense of what we were seeing. Uh, this is qualitative social science research. So we want to get a sense of what's happening in Rueru. And so we also used our own senses to uh, make some observations and make some notes as we were there. Additionally, when I was in Kigali, I met with Anybody who agreed to meet with me, government leaders, NGOs, I met with the World Food Program, the World Bank, et cetera, et cetera, lots of other experts on what they knew about this resettlement program. So what did we find? Here's a photo of Rero Model Green Village. Um, you can imagine this is quite different from Mazane. I'm gonna show you some photos from the island. We have lots of great photos. Um, so this is a fun way to show them. Here's a quick snapshot of some of the uh, quantitative information of what we found. The average household size that we encountered in Rueru was just about five people. 30% are female headed. That's slightly higher than the national average. Um, all of the adults we interviewed were illiterate. We know this because when we do an informed consent procedure with them, they are invited to either sign their name or use a thumbprint if they're not able to read and write. And everybody we encountered did a thumbprint. So what we conclude from this is that the older generation in Rueru did not have access to school. Um, it's gonna be different for the next generation where we find nearly 80% of children of school aged in Rueru now attending school. I think this is a, a, a positive number, but it's not perfect. It's still one in five kids is still not going to school even though school is available and close by. Um, about a quarter of the respondents we spoke to had some work aside from farming, um, but a lot of them reported, well, I used to do this, but since the pandemic, um, I'm no longer able to do this work. So um, some preliminary information there. So what did we hear? We asked respondents, what was life like for you on the island, whether you were on Mazane or Sharita Island? We did not travel to the islands, it's off limits, um, but these are some photos that I found uh, that the UNDP took of the island. So you have a sense of what the living conditions were like there. People talked about fishing as a way of life, um, also a source of nutrition. They had very productive plots. A lot of people talked about growing beans, potatoes, cassava and sorghum on their plots, but they lived very, very isolated lives very difficult to access markets and few services. One person described it this way, we were cut off from the rest of the world. All of the quotes that I use here in this presentation that are in italics are direct quotes from our respondents. Um, the only school they had access to was primary school. Healthcare was a boat ride away. That boat ride was described to us as dangerous. Um, and so people were quite keen to be relocated from their lives on the islands. Why did they move? We asked them, what was the reason you relocated? Um, again, this is not my photo. I obviously wasn't there when relocation was happening, but this was taken. It gives us a bit of an idea. Relocation, as we talked about, was mandatory, but almost everybody we talked to said they, they were glad to be moved. They'd been asking to be moved for many years. Many talked about how they were moving because they were escaping a high risk zone. And many of them credited Paul Kagame specifically uh, saying things like this, the president of the Republic, he is the one 
who gave the order to relocate us and encouraged those who remained to go. So they felt very individually um, supported and, and focused on by the president, um, which we thought was sort of an interesting finding. Then we asked them, well, what was it like for you when you had to move? What actually happened? What was moving like? Well, they took a boat from the island to the shore and then a vehicle transfer to the village. Most of them said they left many of their belongings behind because they were promised new houses that would be furnished and have kitchen equipment. So many talked about having left some of their belongings behind, but they talked a lot about in the process of relocating, being sensitized for what to expect. This is sort of a long quote um, for a presentation like this, so I hope you'll forgive me, um, but it is worth maybe looking at, this is one person's description. They organized and scheduled a day. They began to raise awareness for the relocation and we were happy and prepared. And this, this quote, I think, really captures um, the sense of uh, excitement about relocating that we heard from many of our respondents. So then we asked them, well, what, what do you like about living in Rueru? What is your life like here? And what are some of the advantages? And here's what we heard. Um, number one, proximity to healthcare. This photo on the bottom, this blue building, I think you can see my arrow spinning around here. This blue building on the bottom is the new healthcare center in the Reru village. So this represents walkable, uh, modern, clean healthcare services for families that used to have to travel many hours uh, on a dangerous boat ride. So many, many respondents talked about um, finally having access to healthcare and getting some support for whatever conditions they are dealing with. These two photos on the left are photos of a vocational school. The one on the top is a, um, you can see it's functioning. It's a big warehouse sort of with open sides where apprenticeships are being held. And uh, from what I could see, mostly young men are learning some, some trade and some skills in this setting uh, where they can then go use those skills in off-farm jobs. They're learning construction skills, welding, um, and related type of activities. On the bottom, this is the new school. Hasn't yet opened. There is a primary school nearby that kids can walk to. This school is right in the village. You can see it's fully built, brand new, and hadn't yet opened when I was there. It will eventually support this warehouse in teaching secondary and post-secondary vocational skills to residents. A lot of people talked about the new houses, their first experiences with electricity, and the some of the new furniture that they got when they arrived. A lot of people talked about how happy they were to be able to visit relatives, to go to church, that they were sort of back in the world. Um, other advantages. Everybody got a cow when they moved. Um, that's part of the Gorinka program. And the cows in Rueru are individually owned, but cooperatively housed. And this is quite common across the Imidugudu. Um, and so for many families, this was their first experience having a cow. And so they talked about this as a great advantage of having moved. They also noted, this I thought was really interesting, certainly not everybody who moved was equally wealthy or equally poor. People had very different wealth profiles. Um, and everybody seemed to agree that the poorest households on the islands benefited the most um, because those who really had nothing on the islands now have a house, electricity, a cow, and those foundational supports um, were really life-changing for the poorest households. Um, many talked about having now have opportunities for off-farm employment, and here's a photo that we took of um, one person's small shop that they had in their house. So this is an example of sort of entrepreneurship. This person had to get some microfinance to be able to purchase their um, goods and open a shop. So we saw a lot of these types of uh, miniature shops. We also ask people, well, what's hard for you here in Rueru? What are your challenges that you face? Number one, far and away, almost everybody we talked to said, our plots here are unproductive. We were able to grow more on the island. The weather here is hot, it is dry, and we have small plots that don't grow much. So this was really um, the main problem we heard about. And in some cases, it sounded fairly dire. We had some families that told us 
we're, we're more hungry here in Weru than we were on the islands where we had access to fish and we had productive crops. Here, we suffer from hunger. And here, some of them said, the reason my kids are not going to school, remember 20% of kids are still not going to school, may be because they are hungry. They can't go to school because of lack of nutrition. So this is a real challenge. And we also heard many people who, uh, like we said, this is their first experience in managing cows. And while they are grateful and excited for that opportunity, they don't necessarily know how to do it. So they had a, a lot of them reported difficulty managing cows. Some of them um, had to give the cow back. Um, and so managing the cows was a skill that they were still mastering when we spoke to people. Um, several people told us that drinking water was a problem. And we heard really mixed commentary on this. This is a bit of a um, confusing piece of our findings. Some people said access to reliable drinking water is a great benefit of living in Rueru. But others said we have consistent challenges finding drinking water. It's hard to know exactly what the truth is, and it may just be a different truth for different households. But we did see this. That's the um, drinking uh, water tank on the right. You can kind of see the edge of it. And these people are all lined up with their jerry cans trying to get water. This line extends beyond the edge of the frame of that photo. And so this was a dynamic that, that residents talked to us about. They said, you stand on line all day, and then you get to the front, and the water is gone. Whatever water is left goes to the cows. So there may be a drinking water issue. There's also a policy in Rueru um, that prohibits people from keeping other animals like chickens or goats um, in their compound. And the reason for that we understand is that these are brand new houses and they uh, there's some concern that people will begin to bring their farm animals indoors and that that's not the idea of village life. Um, but not having those animals, not having a goat, not having a chicken is also a nutritional loss and financial loss. People talked about the phases of resettlement being unequal and maybe unfair. Maybe some of the earlier phases got different furniture than the later phases. The houses are a little bit different. The implementation of the villagization policy changed over the years between the first, second, third, and fourth phase. So people had different experiences and those differences by many were experienced as unfair. Um, we also heard from many people who said, I moved here, I'm told this is my property, but I don't yet have a land title. And without a title, I can't get a loan. Um, this may be something that is underway and in progress, but some of those families had been moved years ago and still didn't have a title. Uh, so that's another challenge. What about the pandemic? What was pandemic uh, life revealing about this resettlement policy? Um, we heard from people that the pandemic had disrupted markets for them, for their produce, for their crops. We heard that many of them had their off-farm jobs were eliminated or disrupted um, because of the pandemic. Um, and a lot of people talked about increased isolation just as they were sort of celebrating being in a village um, embracing social cohesion, having closer access to their families, uh, the pandemic arrived and forced them back into their homes with increased isolation. Um, we didn't speak to anybody who had been infected. Um, and in fact, the rates of infection in the village seemed to be quite low, but many people we spoke with said they knew somebody who had been sick. Um, everybody knew about the pandemic. Uh, we didn't see anybody wearing masks or any other sorts of um, that kind of thing. Okay, so I wanna spend a little bit of time on this slide and explain it. Remember, these are the 11 pillars of the integrated development program. This is what a village like the Rueru Model Green Village should be achieving. So based on what we saw and heard in our research, we categorized these 11 pillars into three rankings. The green rankings are the ones that are overwhelmingly successful. The people we spoke to mentioned them. We saw evidence of these being manifest in Rueru. The yellow category is a bit mixed. We either heard different answers from different residents or we weren't quite sure uh, how that it wasn't a full success. There was some hesitation. 
The red are categories that at this point are not successful. These are real uh, missing elements in what we saw in Rueru. The last one, number 11, rehabilitating ecosystems is left blank. We did not assess that. That would have required a different type of data collection. We would have had to consider whether the surrounding ecosystems had benefited from resettlement. Um, and so that was a little bit outside of our range of study. So that one's sort of listed here, but we didn't rank it. So I wanna walk through each one a little bit because I, I feel like this is a bit of a punchline here for the research and I want to explain um, why we ranked each one the way we did. So the first one is social protection. This is the closest match to what I introduced early in this presentation as vulnerability, um, which is the idea that people living in Rueru are housed, fed, have access to their basic needs. Without question, life in Rueru offers greater social protection than life on the islands. They have access to healthcare, they have access to school, they have clean modern houses, they have electricity. Many of them have access to cash and have access to other forms of government support. So that one clearly is a green category. Also infrastructure development with a focus on energy. Um, we saw houses, we saw um, a lot of attention to, I showed you photos of new buildings, uh, new construction, um, opportunities for people to uh, interact in their village uh, at the healthcare center with all of this sort of infrastructure. So that one also uh, ranked really high. Cooperative development. Yes, there is a farmer's cooperative in Rueru, but many people we spoke with said the cooperative was not helping them, that they were going to cease participating in the cooperative. They felt the cooperative was um, uh, not reflecting their own interests and they were skeptical of it. So people were um, not finding the cooperative useful. It exists, but it's not at its full capacity and it's not, um, manifesting in benefits for residents. So we coded that one yellow. Off-farm employment had discussed that throughout this presentation. It exists for about a quarter of the residents, but we see as soon as a shock arrives, like COVID, many of those off-farm jobs disappear. So it's yellow. There are some opportunities, but not robust. Number five, access to credit, promotion of micro microfinance and insurance. Um, some people spoke to us about getting health insurance, so that exists, and they've only gotten it since arriving at Rueru. Many people had access to microfinance in order to set up those little shops in their homes. I showed you some photos of that. But as we said, many people who don't have titles to their land continue to find it difficult to have access to loans. Number six, voluntary resettlement. As we said, this resettlement was not voluntary. So we, we couldn't in good conscience code this one green, but almost everybody we talked to also voluntarily wanted to resettle. So they would have chosen this, they did request it, but it was also mandatory. This one was a bit tricky, we coded it yellow. Leadership development, I think, is a really interesting one to try to sort of operationalize in the field. I think many of the um, structures of these imidugudus are intended to build leadership by giving uh, residents opportunities to participate in the cooperative, to function in, in a sort of democratic space where they're meeting their um, neighbors and making decisions in cooperative uh, in the cow shed, for example, that is cooperatively managed um, and in the village at large. So we saw some of this happening, but we didn't really hear anybody talk about this. It didn't seem like a priority. Um, and as I said, the cooperative was widely not uh, uh, trusted by people. So that's a problem for developing leadership. The last three that you see coded red, we saw no evidence of uh, post-harvest processing or marketing. There may be some of that happening. We didn't see it and nobody really talked about it with us. Um, so that's maybe an opportunity for improvement at Rueru. Land productivity was the biggest problem we saw and heard about. Um, and I think that's the biggest challenge facing residents in Rueru is how they can uh, succeed and feed themselves and their families on these plots in the weather that they have. Um, ICT, we didn't see really any evidence of technology. Nobody talked to us about it. Um, so this one, I don't see a lot of evidence that that's happening. It may be rolled out later and down the road. 
So those are coded red. And as I said, the last one, we didn't evaluate at all. So all that said, there are some limits to our data. I mean, first and most importantly, we studied one village, so we shouldn't take this as a uh, indicator of all villages. There are many, many villages around Rwanda. Um, we ended up interviewing one fourth, roughly 22% of the households in Rueru. Is that saturation? Does that mean we have captured um, the general sense? We're not entirely sure. Uh, I do think we did achieve saturation because we began to hear many of the same themes from the people we spoke to. All four phases were contacted. We had some concern from my team, the interviewers, that on the last day that we were there, they felt some of the respondents uh, were answering questions in a bit of a suspicious way. And we wonder if maybe um, they had been contacted and advised about how to respond to these strange questioners who were coming around the village knocking on doors. Um, so we're not sure uh, how to think about that, but that's a possibility. Um, we also don't know whether Reru is representative of other villages. It is in a, a particularly challenging location. It is extremely remote. The weather is very difficult and it's right on the border with Burundi and it's in a pandemic. So I don't, I, I don't want to suggest that what we found in Reru is true of the entire IDP or of other villages. Um, and what about the pandemic? That might cause our findings and our analysis to be um, altered in some way or disoriented. So we're keeping all of this in mind. What happens next? Some of our big takeaways from this research. This pandemic really offers a glimpse into what happens in a rural village in Rwanda when there is a major shock, whether that shock is a flood or a, a landslide or a pandemic, it's still a shock and it functions to increase risk. And so this offered us an interesting way to think about that. I told you this was in many ways a project about vulnerability and reducing vulnerability, which is a tool for reducing risk, means more investments must be made in social protection and in rural economic opportunity. We saw a lot of opportunity for improvement. My hope and my uh, plan is to conduct future research that allows me to compare Rueru with other model villages around the country and more comprehensively get my arms around the IDP, its strengths and its weaknesses. Um, I'm really keen to open this up for comments or questions. Um, this is my email address if anybody wants to reach me. And I know Beth and Benan and a number of you here um, also have my contact info. So I think maybe I'll stop the share the screen share for questions or I don't know, Beth, do you think I should stop yeah, sharing? Um, I, I, well, it's up to you. Um, we can open it up to questions and if people want to refer to any slides, uh, they yeah. can. And um, I want to encourage people to, um, you know, ask or make comments. You can put them in the chat or you can um, unmute and um, there is a, a symbol um, under reactions for raising your hand, um, but just feel free, you can unmute and we can have a great discussion here. So I wanna turn it over to any questions or comments and thanks so much, Lisa, for a really informative um, presentation that was really, really interesting. I'll also say that my entire team, I think is here on this call. So I invite any of them to Correct me if I've mischaracterized anything or, or add uh, your experiences or your thoughts about this research. We've got a room full of experts here. Any questions or comments? Um, well, I wanted to ask you if um, there are other um, models of green villages in terms of how you know, green is kind of defined and operationalized in in other countries and how the green model concept is um, used in Rwanda is it, because I'm not very familiar with it in other countries. So I'm just curious how, how um, representative it is and how it might be done in other countries. As far as I know, the Rwandan model green village is quite unique. 
I don't know of any, and I've studied it and looked for other examples. There are other examples of sort of planned villages for resettlement programs in other countries, but I haven't seen anything that prioritizes ecosystem protection and environmental um, asset protection in the way that the model green villages do in Rwanda. And Rwanda is also unique because um, it's such a tiny country that the policy of resettling 100% of rural residents into these villages offers a really unique uh, policy. No other country that I know of could do that, right? They're too big, they're too vast, it's too complex. Um, but in a place like Rwanda, it very well might be possible and we're already getting close. So it's a fascinating case to study because I think it offers um, some insights and ideas for other locations. That's really interesting. Thank you. I see Tony has his hand up, so I'm going to turn it over to Tony. You want to ask a question or a comment? Yeah, actually, my question was about um, the location of the islands. Mm. I think I found uh, Mazane Island is kind of in the northeast corner of the lake. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. They're in Lake Mueru. And hmm. where is where's the other one, the other island? Nearby. I don't know, actually. I don't know how to quite map it. They don't show up on any maps, on any Google Maps that I've been able to. Well, I should just with. give a caveat that Tony is a, a remote sensing specialist. So if anybody oh, good. can find it, he can. <laughs> oh, good. Tony, we need you. We need to map this because I have not been able to. I, they don't appear on Google Maps. And uh, I know they're in Lake Rueru, but I don't have a lot of other details. Okay. Okay, yeah. And then I, I actually, I mean, I was even thinking about, you know, we'd, yeah, as a remote sensing specialist, the idea of looking at any uh, spatial changes in the region since the resettlement has occurred, you know, would be potentially an interesting project. Yeah, it really would be. And, you know, when we started this research, we talked about a little bit, and Isaac knows this, Isaac Hitimana, I think, is on this call. We had the idea of mapping out using GIS the village so that we could sort of track where the phases were and we could identify which households we were contacting. We ended up not pursuing that for a couple of reasons. One is it was expensive and time consuming. And, and so that was the main reason. We also really were concerned about um, anonymity and safety for our respondents. So we didn't want to map out which houses we had contacted. That suddenly seemed like a bad idea. Um, and we ended up not pursuing it. But um, I think it would be really valuable and interesting to see what the village looks like mapped. Um, and if, if that helps shed some light, for example, on that ecosystem protection question that I didn't pursue in my research, it might help to see if people have been moved out of um, forest lands, for example, that are now recovering, or if there are other findings we might have. Let's do that, Tony. Yep. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Great. Other questions or comments? Uh, I have a question. Uh, Dr. Risa. Yes. Uh, generally, did you find whether the, the IDP Green Village at Rueru is helping people adapt to climate change effects? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand. Is the question... I'm wondering do if... I'm wondering if that IDP Green Model Village at Rueru is helping local communities to adopt to climate change risks. Yeah, so that's sort of the fundamental research question we were trying to answer. And um, I think it's a complicated question that I, I'm hesitant to say yes or no. Um, instead, you know, I tried to answer that by assessing the 11 pillars of the program that are all intended to reduce vulnerability as a way to reduce risk. Um, certainly, we see people with a roof over their heads, electricity, access to healthcare, that reduces vulnerability and helps them adapt, right? They're sort of healthier and more capable of adapting to a shock. 
But at the same time, many of them told us that they are not able anymore to support their families and feed their families in these new plots that they've been given. And that seems counterproductive to adaptability to climate change as it may very well get increasingly dry where they are. And as that happens, if they cannot feed their families, that seems like negative progress, right? So, um, I think it's a difficult question, and um, that's really the high-level question that I'm interested in. You've, you've nailed the question, um, and I don't quite know how to answer that for Weru, and I certainly don't yet know how to answer that for the IDP as a national policy. Um, but that hopefully is where this research goes next, is to think about how we can answer that question more comprehensively. Yeah, yeah if I can much. just um, jump in on that, it made me, what, what Vinam asked, uh, made me think about the projects we've been working on in, in the center with ecosystem-based adaptation, which is supposed to do two things, build uh, resiliency and, um, and improve human livelihoods, and then also the resiliency of the ecosystems. And so it's that part of the ecosystems and kind of what Tony was asking about as well, like impacts on the the environment around that area. So that, like you said, that would be an interesting next step is to look at bringing those two together, the ecosystem or the environment part with um, the human well-being side. Yeah, and you know, COEB is ideally situated to help me think about that missing piece. And I've been in touch with some of the folks at Fonerwa. I don't know if anybody from there is on this uh, Zoom, um, but the Green Fund, and they're quite interested in this research um, because they have the big green Gichumbi project in the northern province that, that follows the Rueru model. So they're very keen to better understand what's working and not working. And they were really disappointed that I didn't have any information on that ecosystem piece. Um, but I felt like I, I hadn't assessed it and it would require a whole different set of methodology. But I would love to think about with COEB, because that's really your area of expertise, how we could assess that. And if that becomes possible in a future round of research, we can partner on that because I think that's a real gap in my research. Yeah, that would be very interesting. We, um, some of the research associates here and research fellows together with Rayma did some training on e ecosystem-based adaptation. And yeah, that would be very interesting. Um, there's still a few more minutes before four, so I wanna invite anybody else, if you have any comments or questions, feel free to put them into the chat or um, unmute and, and um, ask them directly. Anybody? Can you? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Is it Olivier? Yeah, my name is Olivier. I'm a student at African University. My question is, Dr. Lisa, what did you find as a uniqueness of Green Bridge? when you compare it to other villages? I think I hear that question. Is it how can I compare this village to other villages? Yeah, apart from, apart from being eco-friendly. Uh, I don't know. And, and so my research was only on this one case. And that's really the next step is to begin a comparison. Uh, this research just sort of went deep on the Rueru case, but it raises all sorts of questions for me about other villages. And I'm quite keen to begin to do some comparisons. Um, we may learn, for example, that the Rueru case is really unusual and doesn't represent the IDP or other villages very well. Um, and that would be an important finding. So I hope to come back next summer, uh, if not sooner, and begin to conduct some research on other villages so that we can do that comparison. Um, I also see there's a good question in the chat from Jocelyn. Um, are the 11 pillars uh, established specifically for climate change adaptation? And the answer to that is no. They are not framed as a climate adaptation pillars. They're framed as integrated development. So these are the 11 pillars of what these imidugudu policies that create grouped villages should achieve. Um, the pillars of a successful model village in that setting, um, but not specifically for climate adaptation. So that's kind of the connection that I'm trying to bring to this research is 
connecting these development policies with climate change adaptation to understand or try to ask about whether they are mutually reinforcing and compatible or potentially not. And maybe there are opportunities then to improve, for example, the way the IDP is done to better achieve climate adaptation. So uh, they are not set up by the government as a climate adaptation strategy. Uh, good question, thanks. All right, are there any other, um, I don't see nothing else in the chat, no, and no hands up. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, we're one minute before four, so that was very good Sorry. timing, perfect timing. I, think, <laughs> I have a question. Oh, good, go ahead. Um, so first of all, I want to say, Lisa, I was like following through your, your presentation and everything was right, like correct, I agree with it. So, <laughs> um, so my question is for your further research, do you have any specific criteria and how you choose other villages of interest to compare to this one village that we're doing? We did. Thank you. Good question. This is Grace, by the way, you can't see her, but she's my research assistant here at Columbia, uh, which is why she's fact checking my, my presentation. So thank you, Grace. Um, it's a great question. What I hope to do is to identify villages in each province so that we have geographic uh, sort of validity in the comparison. So I'd love to come back, ideally, um, if I really had uh, funding and time for a longer term, bigger project, it would be fantastic to, to sample one model village in each district uh, across the country. That would be sort of the gold standard. I think if I was able to do that, then we could really Really come to some robust conclusions that are replicable and would be useful for the government. Um, that may be uh, too large and too expensive to actually do. And so I've thought about some other ways I could modify that and uh, would certainly want to um, get a diversity of villages in different types of settings, both geographically and in terms of what hazards they're faced with, how big they are, what led people to be resettled there, how long they've been there. So kind of trying to make sure that we have all different kinds of examples of the way these villages come to be so that we can um, sort of shrink the noise in the data and and identify which patterns persist across all of those sort of differences by sampling from a variety of different villages. I hope to be able to do that in the next year or two. Uh, so I'm looking now actively for ways to fund and support that research. Thanks for asking. Um, well, I think we got all the questions in the chat and um, we don't have any more hands up and it's just at four o'clock. So thank you again so much, Lisa. I hope we continue with this research collaboration and um, thanks to your field assistants for attending and um, supporting the research and everyone who attended today. And if any of you are interested in giving a seminar, do let us know um, because we would love to have you talk about a research idea or a project you finished or a project you're thinking about. Uh, so you can get in touch with Vinat. He's organizing them uh, this time. So thank you all and have a great afternoon or rest of the day. And um, we'll see you next week. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Thank you. Thank you.